Well, if you will, take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27. Matthew, chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27 will be in verses 1 through 5. When you find Matthew 27 and verse 1, those that are able, if you'll stand with me in reverence to the reading of God's holy word. Matthew chapter 27, verse 1. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor, verse 3. Then Judas, which was, had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. Verse 5, And he cast down pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, please be with us in uh, these few minutes, Lord. I just pray, Holy Ghost of God, that you do a work, Lord, that cannot be seen or calculated, Lord. But God, that it go far further than this world, Lord. But God, may you help us, Lord, to be obedient to you, Lord. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Tonight, I want to speak very quickly on a subject, a busted wallet, a broke neck, and a betrayed Savior. A busted wallet, a broken neck, and a betrayed Savior. Here in Matthew chapter 27, verses 1 through 5, we see that this is the betrayal of, that Judas betrays Jesus. We understand that uh, the, the night before they had had Passover and Jesus and his disciples went into the Essene Jews quarter. Uh, that's the conservative Jews. I'll leave that rabbit alone, but that was the conservative solid Jews that were still under... Uh, strictly believing the Bible for what it was. But they went into the upper room and uh, they had that meal. And you remember that Jesus uh, told Judas, finally he said, go and do that what you uh, are supposed to do. And the devil enters into Judas and he goes and he betrays our Lord. And he brings uh, the Pharisees and the scribes and hundreds of soldiers with him, with them, and he betrays Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane where they've gone and Jesus has prayed. Now, Judas is beginning to see the death of Jesus' arrest, that it was going to be more than just a slap on the wrist. It was going to be more uh, than him just going back to ministry or having to leave Jerusalem, but that Jesus was going to die because of his betrayal. And he had gotten guilty about that, and he went back to the priest, and he throwed the silver back in the temple uh, to the priest. Then he went and he hung himself. And what we see tonight is we see that Jesus is the only way out of sin. If you got an idea tonight, a main idea, I'd want you to put this down, that Jesus is the only way out of sin. When we look at verses 1 through 5, first thing we see is that Judas saw that Jesus was condemned. Judas saw that Jesus was condemned. You'll see it in verse 3. He said, Then Judas, which was betray- who betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned. We see that he saw, he had revelation now. It means that all of a sudden, mentally, where he had not seen, foreseen Jesus. Uh, being uh, condemned to death, now he was beginning to see and to understand all of the things that he had done. Friend, if we just had hindsight 2020, if we could just do like the Monday morning quarterbacks on the sports channel, it would be a whole better life, wouldn't it? Because we could redo some things. But friend, now all of a sudden, after he has betrayed Jesus, it says that he saw, and Judas saw that Jesus was condemned. Judas saw Jesus' condemnation but he could not see his own. Isn't that like most of the world today? They can tell you other people's sins. They can tell you where other people are wrong, but they can't see where they themselves are going wrong. We all have that problem at some point in time, but we look and see that Judas could see Jesus' condemnation, but he could not see his own condemnation. Not only that, but as we think about Judas saw that Jesus was condemned, uh, how could Judas... 
not know that death would come to Jesus. How could Judas not understand and know that Jesus was going to be sentenced to die? Because in Luke chapter 22 and verse 3 it says, Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went on his way and communed with the chief priests and the captains how he might betray him unto them. I want you to grab in that, that then entered unto Judas. This was the night before uh, when Judah, Jesus and the disciples went up into the upper room and uh, they had a meal and uh, Judas uh, was told by Jesus, as we said a while ago, to go and do what you need to do. And Satan entered into Jesus. So the question is, how could Judas not know being with Jesus? And Jesus had prophesied to all of the disciples that he was going to die. How could he not know? I submit to you that he couldn't know because he was blinded by Satan. On that night when he left that room, what does it say? That Satan had entered in to Judas and he went to betray Jesus. Friend, can I tell you, I think there's a message here that I've got to dig out and get one for, but there's a process, even not just to salvation, but there's a process to demon possession as well. Friend, I want to tell you there's a process, there was a process of, 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 of Satan uh, manipulating and tempting Judas unto sin, and that sinful desires of his had finally manifested to the point that Satan had full reign and access, that Jesus said, okay, you've, got, you've been turned over to Satan, Satan enters into him, and he goes and betrays Jesus. He was blinded by Satan, is what I'm telling you, when he betrayed Jesus. That's why he couldn't see it beforehand. But Satan never shows us the truth until the aftermath. The fruit in the garden looked good and it was going to give them uh, access as God had access to knowledge of good and evil. But in the end, it wasn't as good as what they thought. But what we see now is that he was blinded by Satan. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. What do you see there? In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds. The God of this world is Satan. Now we know that God is the God of all things, God our Heavenly Father, but I want you to understand that there is a little g God, and that's what's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, little g God, that Satan still has rule and reign where God allows allows it in this earth, and he has blinded the minds of those who believe not. Uh, Judas saw Jesus' condemnation, and he could not understand that Jesus was going to die. Why? Because he had been blinded by Satan. Why is this world? Why are people overdosing on drugs? Why are people doing it time and time again and going back to the same sins like a dog to his vomit? I want to tell you it's because they're blinded by the devil, and they're blinded by their sins. Friend, he didn't know understand that Jesus was going to die and the results of his betrayal to Jesus because he was blinded by Satan. But what did Satan blind him with? Did he just put his hands over his eyes? Not necessarily. But what he did is he used temptation and the desires of Judas himself to betray Jesus. What does James say? James says uh, that we are tempted by our own Lust and drawn away by our own lust, the own things, the own things that we desire. So Satan had blinded Judas uh, with his love for money. Uh, we see that he had a lust for money. Did you know that he was the secretary or the financial guy? He was the money bag holder of the disciples. And I'm telling you, he had finally stole enough money out of it. Do you remember he got ill one time because of what they were giving away? And he says, we don't need to, we don't need to buy that bottle of perfume. That's way too much cost. No, that's a lot of money. Don't, don't break that perfume to pour on Jesus. We can put that into the kitty and sell it and, and bring in and do a lot of ministry. What Judas was saying was, he was saying, hey, uh, we need that over here because that could fill my pockets. He was the money exchanger. He held the money. My goodness, why would they put Judas in charge of the money? We look and we see that he had a lust for money. Matthew chapter 26, verse 14. Flip back one, one chapter and look there with me. Matthew 26 and verse 14. The, the one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will you give me? What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And the, 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 
and they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver and from that time he sought opportunity to betray Jesus. The devil had blinded him with his lust for money. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I'm going to tell you, Judas pierced himself with the love of money and it brought many sorrows for him. It actually brought an early death and a long term in a devil's hell lest he give his life to Christ and I don't see it anywhere in the Bible. But what we see is that, friend, I want you to understand that Satan had blinded him with the lust of money. What are you desiring tonight? What's that secret sin that you've got? Hey, you've got some pockets of darkness in your life just like I've got some pockets of of darkness in mind. And every now and then do you ever get that old thought or that old darkness comes back all of a sudden and all of a sudden you feel temptation on it. Maybe it's through a phone. Maybe it's through a TV program. Maybe it's through a song. Maybe you hear one of them old oldie songs from way back when and it start make you start bouncing a little bit and take you back to some thoughts where you didn't need to be. But friend, I want you to understand that the devil is always working and he's going to blind you with the very things that are still down in your soul and still down in your heart. And it's those those very things that he's going to blind you with. That's what he did here with Judas. Blinded doesn't, here when we talk about blinded, it's not talking about the inability to see anything. We're not saying that Judas couldn't see any, was walking around with a stick, uh, feeling curbs and light poles as he's walking down the street. And we're not talking about blinded being an inability to see anything, but he was blinded with the ability to see the wrong things. He was blinded and all he could see was the wrong things. All he could see was the silver. All he could see was the money that he could exchange for the Savior. He wasn't looking at the Savior. He wasn't thinking about the repercussions of his, of his actions. But what he was seeing was money, money, money. Maybe it had been a brand new donkey off the street. Today it would have been a brand new diesel Ford or a brand new diesel Chevy if he was saved. But the, the, it was the ability to see the wrong things. First Peter chapter five verse eight tells us that we be be careful uh, in everything because the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh to and fro, seeking whom he may devour, uh, walking the streets and finding the things and weaknesses of those. And he found Judas's weakness and he began to work and grind and tempt and moved for quite some time before it finally manifested into a complete sellout of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, uh, I like the way one preacher said it, you desire something long enough, the devil will give it to you before it's all, all said and done, unless you repent of your sins and get back right with God. Friend, we look and we see that he was blinded by sin. Judas saw that Jesus was condemned. There is one thing that Satan has the inability to do. You know what that is? That's to bring joy. Judas had received this money and he had received 30 pieces of silver that was enough that to bring satisfaction to turn Jesus in to the authorities. But for some reason, that money alone that the devil had convinced him was a just cause to, to go against God for uh, was not bringing the satisfaction that he wanted and that he thought it would bring. He was a liar and a thief who does not have the power Power to bring joy. The devil can't give you anything but what he has, and that's misery and destruction and uh, denial of God upon his own uh, life and being. Friend, the devil has no power to bring joy. And the promises that he gives, the satisfaction of, of, of sin, will never bring lasting joy but only for a season. Judas saw that Jesus was condemned. Secondly, I want you to see that Judas saw the effects of his sin in verses 3 and verse 4. Judas saw the effects of his sin. Look with me first at verse 3, the second sentence. And it says in verse 3, it says, uh, When he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, and brought again the thirty pieces of silver, to the chief priests and elders, verse 4, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent 
blood. Judas saw the effects of his sin now. He said in verse 4, he said, I have sinned. When you look at verse 3, second sentence, what did he say? He repented himself. Sounds like a salvation statement, but it's not a salvation statement. Salvation is more than just a statement. We understand that. And here he repented himself. His repentance was not a product of conviction of God for his wrongdoing, but it was a product of self-centeredness and guilt that was upon him because things did not turn out the way he wanted them to. He was guilty. There's a difference in being convicted for your sins and sorry for your sins and being guilty that you got caught. Friend, I want you to understand tonight that Judas would have been fine. He'd have never had any kind of repentant attitude. If Jesus would have been turned loose by the authorities and went back to ministry, he'd have had his 30 pieces of silver. He'd have separated from the group, went on about his business. He'd have bought him a little shanty shack on the side of Jerusalem Hill there somewhere with a pretty flower garden, and he was going to enjoy life. But all of a sudden, just because he got caught and didn't have the expected outturn, now he was feeling guilty for what he had done. And it's more than feeling guilty. Friend, I want you to understand that he was not convicted to salvation for wrongdoing. He was just guilty. He realized the result of his sin, but could not see the source of his sin. You see, when he came back, he brought the silver back and he threw it back into the to the uh, uh, to the uh, 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 the priest there, thinking that that was going to fix things. But the money ultimately wasn't the problem. The money in hand, it the source of the sin was Judas's wicked heart himself. That was the source of sin. But he could not understand that he was ultimately the problem that was going on. When we think about Judas saw the effects of his sin, I think about that word betrayed, innocent blood in chapter 4 in the second sentence. It says, saying I have sinned, I have betrayed innocent blood. The lost world can see, they can respect, and they can react to true Christians. Do you see that here Judas is a lost man. Uh, He's lost and and headed to a devil's hell because he has never truly repented of of his sins and trusted Christ as his Lord and Savior. Maybe there's some out there that want to argue about that, but I ain't ready to argue. Don't want to argue about it, but Judas was a lost man because he betrayed his Lord and Savior for the love of money. Is that not enough? How many people today are, are, are betraying him for so much less? Betraying him for alcohol, betraying him for drugs, betraying him for sex, betraying him for pervertedness, betraying him for uh, baseball, betraying him for so many other things in life that are so simple. But friend, he was lost and undone because he was betraying an almighty God for something as simple as silver. He betrayed innocent blood and the loss is a proof that even lost men in their darkness, they can see truth. And they can see your good actions. They can see your good will. They can see God in you because they saw the Son of God and He still understood that He had betrayed innocent blood even though He had betrayed Him. Friend, it's even those in the workplace that might work against you, that might conspire against you, that even though they might conspire against you, they understand and they know that you are a righteous person if you are a righteous person. That's a hope to us tonight to just be faithful and to keep pressing forth and to be an influence even when we think we're not being an influence to a lost and dying world. Judas saw the effects of his sin. He says in verse 4, he, uh, when, after he says in verse 4, he says, saying, I have sinned, I have betrayed innocent blood. Uh, he's telling this to the priest whom he had betrayed Jesus to. These were his cohorts in this wicked deed that went on. And they said, what is this th- to us? See thou to that. What have we got to do with that? Don't bring that in here to us. We made a deal. We did a deal. Don't bring your guilty convictions in here to us. You deal with that. Friend, what does that show us? And what does that state... Statement show us that partners in crime are only temporary. Friend, I want you to understand one thing, that the people that you're trying to impress, the people that you're trying to walk with, the people that you're trying to run with, denying God and working against God for, that when things go south, they're not going to be the ones that's going to be there for you. Those that you're trying to chase down to the bar, those that you're trying to ride to Harleys with, Uh uh-oh, I'm in trouble with Harleys, I ain't said that in a long time, but those that you're riding to Harleys with and, and doing the things that you shouldn't be doing, friend, I want you to understand that they are only temporary friends and when things aren't going so well and good, they're going to be the first ones to tell you, what has that got to do with me? 
Friend, I want you to understand not only that, but partners in crime are unconcerned about your problems. Friend, I want you to understand maybe you think they're good. Maybe you think they're friends. But those who are ungodly to a Christian tonight, uh, trying to walk with them and talk with them and carry on, they're unconcerned ultimately about your problems. Because all lost sinners are self-centered. Maybe there's some good ones out there. Maybe they, they've got a good personality and maybe they seem concerned. But ultimately, when the rubber meets the road, people are unconcerned with your problems. There's only one person that's really going to ultimately uh, be concerned about your problems, and that's God's going to help you every step of the way. There's one other group of people that should be, and that's the church of the living God and fellow brothers who should be concerned about others' problems. And that's as close as you're going to get on this side. Friend, I want you to understand, we see here that the ones that he had influenced him, the ones that he had done crime with, are now turning their backs on Him. And that's what the devil's crowd and the world's crowd does when you try to turn away from your sins. Judas saw the effects of his sin. When we look at verse 4 there, we see also that they said, not only what is this to us, they were unconcerned, but they also said, see thou to it. That's your business. You see to that. That's between you and God or whoever you're calling or whatever's giving you this conviction. Friend, I want you to understand that we, are alone, we alone are solely responsible for our sins. There's nobody going to stand for us. Listen, we might sin with a group. We might sin with a great group. We might sin with a whole nation. But what we need to understand is that there's going to be individual accountability. There'll be an overall national accountability of God, but there'll also be an individual accountability. And what we need to understand is what these priests understood. They had some good doctrine in that area, even though they were wrong in a lot of places, is that they were he was solely responsible for what he had done. You deal with that. Friend, I want you to understand that what the Bible says is that we will all give an account before Almighty God for the things that we've done, good whether they be good or whether they be bad. We're going to stand before God and give an account to Him. Uh, we uh, alone are solely responsible for our sins. There's only two things that we can do as we're responsible for our sins. Number one, we can give them to Christ. Or number two, we can deal with them ourselves. The only two things that you can do with them. Give them to Christ or deal with them yourself. Judas chose to deal with them himself rather than to go to Almighty Christ. We see that Judas saw the effects of his sin. But thirdly, I want you to see that Judas saw no way out of his sin. Judas saw no way out of his sin. What does he say in verse 5 if you look there with me? And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Judas saw no way out of his sin. It says he cast down the pieces of silver. Judas was trying to fix his sin problem by self. He would come back and he felt in some way, he felt the guilt and the weight of what he had done. It had not turned out the way he wanted it to turn out. It was not spiritual conviction, but it was just guilt. Uh, and what we see is that he comes back, he tries to fix the problem. If I can throw the money back, because the money is a guilt to me now. The money is, a, is making me feel bad because it's dirty money. Uh, I don't think dirty money spends too good. My mama told me one time, she said, money that's given to you from death doesn't spend too good either. And I think that's probably true. But friend, I want you to understand that here he is, and he's trying to fix the problem himself. He's chosen rather than to give it to Christ, as he could have. He chose to hold his sins and fix them himself. Judas tried to fix his sin problem by self. And we understand that sin cannot be taken back as he was trying to give it back. What was he doing? He was coming in. He was trying to throw the silver back into the temple. He was throwing it back to the priest. Why? He was trying to redo what he had already done. Can I just tell you, we can't relive the bad events in our life. I wish we could. I wish I could in some of my parts of my life. I wish I could dial, to, dial back and redo some things. But here's the thing, is that it can't be taken back. It can't be brought back. And he didn't understand understand that he was trying to fix it himself so here he is dealing with this problem to the point of deep dark depression trying to deal with the problem and he starts looking to resources around him rather than looking inside he started looking at the things around him and he knew that the money was the problem for him it wasn't his heart but it was the money and he throws it back trying to deal with the sin himself but it cannot be uh, sin cannot be taken back it can only be forgiven and God is the one that can forgive us of our sins. And man, as good as we like to talk about forgiveness, it sure is hard for us people to forgive, isn't it? It's hard. 
But he looked to self rather than to the Savior. He's coming back and he's throwing the money back and casting it down, trying to deal with sin in his own way. Is that not what most people that are struggling with sin who aren't saved are doing? Drug addictions, alcohol addictions, all of these addictions is they keep coming back to rehab and trying to redo it. And they'll take their bottle and break it on the wall and throw it away and get rid of it. But in essence, they're doing everything physically in their own power trying to deal with something that's an inner problem that only God can deal with. Can I just remind you that Jesus is the only one that can heal and forgive your sins and cast them as far as the east is from the west. Sin always leaves us empty handed, doesn't it? Well, what did his sin do? It left him empty handed. The very thing that he betrayed the Lord and Savior for, the silver that he had in his hand, he threw it and there he is left empty handed with no benefit even for the sin that he had done. It'd be nice if he'd at least kept the silver and spent it on himself. At least he'd had some kind of benefit from his sin, but here he is left with nothing now. But that's the way Satan always does this thing. He talks us into doing things that we think are going to bring satisfaction and they don't bring satisfaction. And then he sits there and speaks in our ear and talks about how foolish we are and how damned we are and how you did God wrong and how silly you are. Boy, you listen to me. And he drives them deeper into depression. And here he is. He's left empty handed. And those who fall into deep sin are always left empty handed. Even when he, we have our desires in our hand. Do you see that he had the very desire? Do you see that he thought that silver and money was good enough to betray God over? And here he's got it in his hand and there is still no joy and there is still no satisfaction even though it's in his hands. Can I just remind you one more time that that deep darkest thing that you're wanting so bad, when you get it, if you ain't got God, it ain't worth two cents. Fools grasp at the wind, the Bible says. We can look in Proverbs and find verses where it says that fools are just walking around and grasping at the wind. You can't catch the wind. How are you going to catch wind? You might catch something upside your head in a hurricane from a, from a wind, but that's about it. But friend, grasping at the wind. Blow right up, try to catch your breath and see if it works out for you. That's what it looks like the Judases of this world who are betraying God, thinking that money or the things of Satan are going to bring some satisfaction. They'll never have the desires of their hearts and they'll never have satisfaction when it's in their hand. Getting rid of sin will not bring deliverance. We learn from this, from guilt. Getting rid of sin will not bring deliverance from guilt. Here he is, he brings uh, his known rebellion, the sinful thing of God. He thinks he's going to deal with it himself. He's going to get satisfaction. He throws it in. He gets rid of it. It's a good thing, isn't it? I mean, that's pretty good. You fessed up to your sin. But it did not remove the guilt. Why? Because he still went and he hung himself. Still went and hung himself. The guilt was still there because the guilt and depression can only be removed by God Almighty. Friend, I want you to understand, here we see that we must get rid of the source of sin, not the substance of sin. And the source of sin was His heart. And the source of our sins today is our wicked hearts. We've got to deal with the heart and not the outer. We look in the past to David and David when he lay with Bathsheba, what he tried to he tried to fix his sin. He ended up lying, then he killed Uriah and his baby ended up dying and he tried to fix his sin. What did Moses do when he slayed the Egyptian? He buried the Egyptian. What was he doing? He was trying to hide his sin. Adam and Eve, when they tried, uh, when they had sinned in the garden, what did they do? They tried to fix their sin. Me and Fred was talking about a while ago. They covered themselves with fig leaves, and those leaves weren't good enough covering, were they? Old Johnny Hunt said this. He said, Anything you cover, got to uncover. Anything you uncover, got to cover it. Friend, I want you to understand that we can't fix our sins. We've got to help, have some help from Jesus. Judas was trying to fix his sins and he saw no way out of his sin Judas tried to fix a sin problem by suicide you see it there in verse 5 it says he went and hanged himself he went and hanged himself you know the whole story is not told there he did go and he went and hanged himself Acts chapter 1 and verse 18 gives us a little bit more detail of this Acts chapter 1 verse 18 I'll, I'll start At verse 18, now this man, is speaking of uh, uh, Judas, purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. And falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst. 
and all his bowels gushed out. When Judas had tried to hang himself, uh, evidently the, 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 uh, the, the, the rope broke or the limb broke and he fell against a rock on the clevis and it hit him in the midst and all of his bowels and innards busted out whenever he tried to hang himself. Friend, I'm telling you, suicide won't even work out uh, for yourself. He couldn't even do that right. That didn't even mean right because God was still in this thing. Friend, don't you understand that he went and hanged himself and he was trying to fix his problems. He began to think that death was the only way out. Can I tell you where you're going to get uh, when, 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 when you have sins harbored up and you won't give them up and you won't get rid of them? You know it drives you into depression. I'm not saying all depression is because of this. There are some people who are just sick physically. But I'm telling you, most of the the problems that we have today are sin problems that people are harboring in their hearts. They won't give them to God because they're trying to deal with them themselves and they're going deeper and deeper into sin. And Satan's driving them deeper and deeper. He always tries to long for your death. And here he is and he went and he hanged himself because he was trying to fix it himself. Can I tell you that is the only way out of this side of sin for those outside of Jesus Christ is to close your eyes in death. But the uh, the alternative is not the best alternative. Because Judas, Judas, unless there's something that we don't know that somehow he came into salvation, which we don't see it in the Scriptures, that Judas today screams out in a devil's hell. And friend, I believe that the Bible says their worm dieth not. When, we go, when people go to hell, their worm dieth not. Their sin that eats and corrupts them doesn't die not. Well, I don't know, and I'm not glorying in this, but perhaps he's there in that pit. And my friend, maybe he's just hearing the, the tingling sounds of the 30 pieces of silver around him constantly and consistently. Maybe he's chasing after a bag of money and he never can reach it for all of eternity at that sin. And, and that's his judgment. I don't know. I don't understand it all. But friend, I'm going to tell you, his worm ain't died. His lust of money has not died. And the day he cries out from a devil's hell, having laid his hands upon the Savior, when he could have had every opportunity for salvation. Why? Because he had had the lust of this world rather than loving the God of the next world. Friend, I want you to understand that he tried to fix his sin problem through suicide. Can I tell you, that's never a fix to any problem. All that does is cause problems to be worse. Judas could not fix his problem, so he thought he would end his pain. This only began his suffering in an eternity in hell. Hell is real and hell is forever. Friend, I know today we're in a postmodern world and we're so desensitized because of uh, horror movies and haunted houses and all of these things and, and celebrating Halloween and <coughs> all of these devil days. But friend, I want you to understand that what we need to understand is that hell is a real place and it is for eternity. And today, the man that, that, that was rich there with Lazarus is still crying out in hell. Judas is still crying out in hell. And all of those who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and His way of salvation are in a devil's hell and they will be there for all of eternity. And I don't say that that I like it. I don't say that. I say that with a broken heart today because we don't have to go there because Jesus went to the cross and died for us. He was trying to fix his own problem through suicide. Only through Christ can pain be fixed. Only through Jesus. Only through Christ. Not even through medications. We've got a whole world on, on antidepressants and all this stuff. And I'm not saying uh, that nobody needs some of it, but I'm saying the majority don't need it. What they need to do is get right with God. Get right with God. That's what the world's needing because Jesus is the only one that can really ultimately fix the pain that has been caused by sin. What did Matthew say? Jesus said, Come unto me, all of you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come unto the Lord. Come unto the Savior. Don't run from Him. Don't go fix it yourself. But let Jesus fix your sin problems rather than you trying to fix your sin problems like Judas did. Judas chose a broke neck and busted bowels caused by himself rather than a new heart caused by Jesus Christ. Boy, what a foolish trade. Boy, what, a, what ignorance that is. But friend, he's no more ignorant than what the rest of the world is today, trading out for such simple things and temporary things in life when Jesus has all to give us. Judas hung himself on a tree when all he had to do was look 
to a tree. The tree that Jesus hung himself on at Calvary. Friend, I'm telling you, he hung himself when Jesus was fixing to go and hang himself for him. If he had just looked to the tree of Calvary. Judas saw no way out of his sin. But I'm thankful tonight that, friend, we don't have to be Judas's. All of us have betrayed Jesus in some way, form, or fashion before we were saved. Even since we've been saved, we've let God down. We've worked against God. We've done wicked things and evil things. But friend, I want to tell you tonight that there is a way out of sin. And for those that don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, friend, you're trying to fix your problems. You're going to doctors. You're going to psychiatrists. You're going all over the place. Doing all kinds of things, everything except going to the cross of Calvary. Friend, can I tell you, there's more that can be solved on an old-fashioned altar than there can be for years at a doctor's office. There's more that can be done on the altar in just a few minutes than there can of several attempts at suicide. There's more that can be done on an altar uh, surrendering to God than there will ever be in a crack house, in a dope house, in a bar, or anywhere else. Friend, don't you understand that Jesus has the answer for today's world. And uh, I'd rather choose Jesus than to exhaust my own body and self trying to fix things myself to no avail. Satan will always leave you empty-handed and drive you to death where God will fill you with fullness and give you eternal life. The choice is yours, just as Judas had a choice. As we come to a time of altar call, every head bowed, every eye closed, our musicians come forward to play softly. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. God, we hate to even talk about hell and people that are there. But God, we know that the reality still stands. That we need to know that there is a place of eternal judgment for those who will not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, tonight I pray, Lord, that You would move in hearts, that You would move in lives. God, if there be one that will be lost and undone amongst us, Lord, that they be saved before it's everlasting too late. God, for those who might be here, Lord, that are struggling with past sin. Maybe they're struggling with some past event. God, may you help them. God, to turn to you, to pull out of the pit of hatred, to pull out of the pit of bitterness, to pull out of the pit of envy, to pull out of the pit of hurt, Lord, that Satan has bound them with. God, we just pray that they'd look up to you. And God, that you would reach down your mighty hand into the horrible pits of this world and pull people out of the depressions of sin as cause, Lord. Save their souls and change them forevermore, Lord. God, perhaps there's Christians tonight who are struggling. I pray, God, that you give them the strength and the ability to to deal with things tonight. Maybe there's a Christian here tonight that's been dealing with something for a long time. I pray tonight that they'd have the courage, Lord, to walk down to an altar and deal with it tonight before they'd even leave this place. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. As we stand and sing, you be obedient tonight. This altar's open. If God's dealing with your heart, Deal with what's working in your heart tonight. Deal with the sins. Deal with the past. Deal with the problems. There's no better time than to respond tonight on this altar. As we stand and sing.